Okay. So what we're looking at here is the basic uh, home tab on power options. And we've got some of these data pods that are set up for you. And uh, of course, this is my, my personal account, how I have it set up. But I have some data pods. The first things I look at the morning are some of the stocks I'm trading in list one or list two or list three on the watch list. Um, market activity, I can see immediately what has happened to the major indexes and the volatility index. The top stock gainers and losers today and earnings coming up as well, maybe ex-dividends coming up. One of the main pods we have here is the market sentiment tool. And what I'm going to address here is this is a question from John. And John asked, you know, I've been following the market sentiment tool. John is a subscriber of Power Options. He says, I've been following the market sentiment tool and using it for my married put trades, and it's been working out really well. But is there any sort of further insight into the market sentiment tool? Okay, well, let's review the market sentiment tool very quickly. What this tool is, is a set of 13 indicators that represent the broad market conditions. Ernie tested these indicators over a course of a very long time. You know, he used probably 30 or 40 different indicators, market indicators at one point. He narrowed it down to 13, which really gave the best representation of when a market is changing or a market is moving or what indicators do what when, when the market does shift. And so we see a general count here. The current summary is 12 of those indicators are currently at neutral. One is a bearish indicator right now and zero are bullish. Okay, so what this gives us is a gauge of where do those 13 indicators stand. Now, if this shifts and on, uh, you know, Monday this opens up and four of these are bearish and eight of these are neutral and one is even bullish, this would go to a uh, slight sell warning or minor sell warning indicating a bearish. If this goes up to five or six, you'd see a strong bear signal and reverse with the bullish as well. Now, what are these indicators directly? Well, when you click on the view indicator details here, we can see the list of the 13 indicators, put call volume ratio, number of days SPX is up, that's actually bearish right now, uh, the SPX gap over the SMA20, the number or percentage of stocks currently over the SMA20, uh, the ratio of new 52-week highs and lows, the volatility index, of course, it's neutral, but it's leaning towards bearish right now. Uh, trend, RSI for the SPX, and uh, the number percentage of stocks over the 100-day moving average. And you see these different fences here, these sliders for bullish to bearish, neutral in between. And how are these found? Well, once Ernie found the indicators that made the most sense over time, over various market conditions over decades, I believe. What he decided to do is, what's really important, is to go through, I'm gonna click the details button here next to this particular one. Sorry, let's go ahead and do that. And he plotted, of course, the historical distribution of each of these individual indicators over time to see that, yes, when the SPX number of days up goes into this three or four range, it very rarely ever continues up. Beyond that, there's usually a give, a little bit of easing, a little bit of release. Okay, so with this being up three days in a row, right now SPX number of days up, even though somewhat small, not necessarily large. We see here that we're in a bearish indicator because usually that indicates that it's gonna pull back. Now it could go up on Monday. This isn't saying that Monday is gonna be bullish. This is going to say Monday is going to be bearish for the broad-based indicators. It's just saying that in general, we don't see a lot of continued movement upwards over time on this particular indicator. So we expect it maybe to drop within the next couple of days. Could only be a little bit. Uh, it could be a lot. Okay, so we'll just have to wait and see. Now, why isn't the market as a whole, or the, I should say, the market sentiment is a whole bearish if we think the SPX might pull down because it's been up three days in a row. And it might go to four days, but it very rarely goes to five, as you can see by the historical graph here. Okay. Well, the reason why is because we want to see triggers and others. As we mentioned, that put call volume ratio, right, that's almost bearish now too. That's pretty close. As was the VIX, that's pretty close. So we might actually see after Monday, potentially, 
the put call volume ratio, the VIX. I don't know if the trend would move that far, the trend indicator, but we might see another three go to bearish, in which case we would have a light bear warning or light sell warning. Right? If we see three or four of those trigger in addition to the SPX, if the SPX continues up on Monday, some of these others might trigger. Now, how do we use this? Okay, well, when John asked the question via email today, what he was asking is that he you know, had a really good success following this indicator and recently saw light buy on 531 and on 63. And you can see how the SPX was affected. It gradually has been moving up the past three days since that light buy was indicated. So when you see a light buy, what's a good strategy to go in? Well, it means a light buy, a married put, a protected stock position. Coming off of a low, looks like it's going to see a light buy, going to go up for the next few days, might give us a chance to generate income. A covered call might be a good light buy. Out of the money bull put credit spread, out of the money naked put, that might be a good position as well. At the money bull call debit spreads possibly is another indicator. A light buy to me would not indicate buying a call, okay, or doing something speculative, expecting a large move. This might just be a light move over the next five, six to 10 days. And of course, we see other indicators around neutral here, but I'm gonna go back in time. So this dropped me right back to uh, May 6th. And I can, I can go to the date, but I'm just gonna go back in time. And you see right around May 3rd, see here, the first one, sell warning was triggered on or around April 10th. Then again, on April 22nd, 23rd, uh, end of April, and then of course in May. So we saw a light sell warning on May 3rd, and it did prompt, you know, sort of a decline from 29.45 down uh, for the next several days going forward into May, and then it recovered again slightly. But really, so you see the sell warnings here, when you had them two days in a row at 2.939, was an indicator we were probably going to drop over time. You know, we hit that 2.917 and 2.923 there as well. So it was being pushed down at times. Now, the one sell warning, you see it moved back up. I know it's a little tough to see. But then you had two, and then we had two more, and then eventually it started to drop down a few days later. So it's not a direct indicator of what's going to happen tomorrow. It's not saying what's going to happen uh, over a 12-day, over a 50-day, over a 100-day period. It's more designed to give us a good indicator of when in the next few days we might expect to see a shift. It might be a short shift. It could be more pronounced. But, of course, then we might see sort of a higher uh, strong sell warning or a strong buy warning, uh, which we saw, you know, back at the end of December, I believe December 28th or so at the end of that drop when things started to recover. Okay. So in addition to that, I got some other questions I'm coming in. All right. Great question there. And Robert, you've got some good questions here too. I just want to make sure here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So how do I use this? Well, let's go to current again. All right, so right now we're at neutral. But as John mentioned, a few days ago we saw the light buy and we saw some increase in the SPX. It's been slow and gradual, but we've seen some increase over that time since it got triggered to the light buy. As again, as I mentioned, when I see a light buy, that might mean some safe, sort of out of the money, maybe naked puts, covered calls, collar position, maybe even a married put. If I'm in a position, such as a covered call, for example, that's maybe near the stock price. And this is something that's a core holding in my account and I want to hold it longer term and I see a light buy or a strong buy, I may roll that covered call up preemptively so I don't get caught getting deep in the money covered call and then having to pay more intrinsic to buy it back. If I'm in a bull put credit spread, a calendar call spread, for example, a bullish spread position, maybe even a covered call, and I see that a uh, strong sell warning come up, I may exit the position if I have a profit. Um, I may adjust the position to go further out expecting the stock to fall. Okay. Also, if I see a strong sell warning, I may be tempted to buy a call on the VIX perhaps if it hasn't moved yet and they're affordable or buy puts on the broad-based indexes to hedge the portfolio as a whole. And of course, if I see a strong buy, might double dip with some long calls uh, on SPY, NDX, or something along those lines to get that strong bull sell or strong bull alert there 
very bullish buy, I think it would come up as. I might buy some calls in some different stocks, some uh, FANG stocks perhaps, or maybe some broad-based indicators. So I use this not only to help me sometimes with trade entry, but a lot of times with trade management as well, positions I'm already in or adjustments that I may need to make as well. Okay, so that's a brief review of the market sentiment tool on Power Options for trial members and subscribers. And there's a full video here about 19 minutes long that goes a little bit more in depth into that. And per John's question uh, also, um, I'm sorry, what I'll do in the next week or maybe the next 10 days or so is for Fusion members and Blueprint owners, Fusion subscribers and Blueprint owners, we might put together a little presentation on how I use the market sentiment tool to adjust the radioactive trades when considering uh, the income methods. In other words, if I see a light buy, what of the 12 income methods might that lead me to on a position that may or may not have an income method open? Uh, if I see a strong sell warning, for example, what might that lead me to as well? That'll be coming up for subscribers later on. Okay, now we're gonna go right to Robert's question. Let me clear up the drawings. It's related to the portfolio. And in the portfolio tool, we can create multiple positions, of course. Okay, um, this is just for the radioactive ones. Let me see if I can go back here. Something recent. Oh, shoot, did that again. Okay, I'll have to block that out. Actually, let me, oh, good, the screen's paused. Okay, so that didn't do that. I'm gonna do something real quick while the screen's paused. I know you guys aren't seeing it. Um, I was actually on my personal account there for power options and the reason I was on there is to get more of the history uh, for the market sentiment tools so we could go back and see that on the trial version you can still get a few days of the history there on the historical chain and more um, but I just wanted to have okay all right never mind one second folks I apologize <laughs> Okay. Now. Okay, good. Now I'll show the screen. My sincerest apologies. Back to square one. All right. So we've got a couple uh, positions here, a custom spread and a long strangle. Robert's question related to the portfolio entries is, is there a way to set an alert for either the value of the option itself. Example, if the market value of a call, iron condor, uh, covered call, goes above or low in alert value, will we be notified? Absolutely, okay? And he says, I'm at the option position itself, i.e. vertical iron condor, not simply the option value. Yes, all right, so let's go ahead and enter a iron condor on SPY. Why not? It's not a trade recommendation or suggestion. I just wanna enter into an iron condor. So I'm gonna to go to select a new strategy. I'm gonna enter an iron condor. Let's see here. The sell to open put and buy to open put. I'll use SPY. I'm just gonna guess here. I'm gonna go out to standard, uh, not a standard expiration, ladies and gentlemen. I'm gonna go out to just maybe next Friday, seven days away. Um, the 14th. Okay, so SPY is at 287. No premium, no premium, no premium. It's got to make sense. All right. We'll do the 280 sell, 278 buy. Okay. I'll just select the different options. Okay. And then with the stock, I'm sorry, with SPY, I should say. <laughs> All right, so I want to go ahead and keep about the same distance. So I'm in at 287 points down. Let's go 294-ish. Now I'll go 292 to 294. All right, so I'm just selecting the options real quick. It'll just be one second. All right. Okay, so we'll just do one contract of each. So I'm selling the 280 put, buying the 278, selling a 292 call, buying a 294. 
Again, not a recommendation or suggestion. We're just going to put this into our portfolio. All right, so there's our iron condor on SPY. Now, any position you enter, whether it's my strangle, whether it's my iron condor, whether it's a custom spread, a covered call, anything along those lines, the third column here for alerts, I'm going to click on View. Okay, and this allows me to set alerts for the stock price on the different leg, stock percentage change, option percent change individually, days remaining to expiration, and more. This is a tough one because I can do it for all four legs. Now here, it's not price necessarily, Robert, but it's position percent change. So I currently got in at a net credit of 44 cents at midpoint, and the ask Worst case scenario, the market value to close it if I liquidate it would be 49. So I'm losing uh, 5 cents if I liquidate right now. But if I want to be notified if this position increases in my favor or decreases against me, I can just put in a percentage. Decrease by 5%, increase by, oh, let's just do 1. Okay, that's, that's pretty much 1%. So increase at 1% and increase at 1%. And I'll mark them both as red indicators, okay? And you can see here, I can also set alerts on any position if the stock moves above or below a 20-day or 50-day moving average, goes beyond the Bollinger Band, days till earnings, days until ex-dividend and more. All right, so I'm going to do a percentage position change of 1% one way or the other. Click on Save Alerts, okay? And you see here, I don't know if you saw that, but the alert is now triggered. Okay, so my alert is now triggered, letting me know that I am down 1% on this position just due to the bid ask spread and the buyback cost at market. Okay, so what do I want to do now? My alert is highlighted when I check my portfolio in the morning, say, uh oh, something's wrong with my iron condor. I click on view, position decrease triggered. Um, you know, I'm at down 11.4%. Why? Because I got 44 for the credit. But it's going to cost me 49 to close it. Five cents on 44, a decrease against me of 11.4%. Okay, so Robert, I can't do, I don't have value of the overall net credit, meaning that if you sold a 20 cent net credit out of the money bull put credit spread, you want to be notified if you can buy it back for 10 cents buy it back for half of what you expected. Or let's say you sold it for 50, you want to buy it back at 25. Well, in that case, you can just put an alert to be triggered if your increase hits 50%. Mark that as green, so you can buy it back. On the same token, if I collected 50 cents and I wanted to be notified if it goes against me half of that, 25 cents, then I put my decrease also at 50, mark that as red. The system knows you sold a credit. The system knows you were in a debit spread or a credit spread, so it would know which direction is a profit or loss for you, and that's what you fill into the position percent change. You'll see this on covered calls, credit spreads, even married puts, um, iron condors, iron butterflies, and more. Okay, so I know you're looking for the value, but you can use the position percent change here. That's for the entire position, all two, three, or four legs of your particular strategy there. Um, that you can set as well. Can you receive email alerts? Absolutely, right here. Uh, for subscribers on the uh, 20 minute delayed service or above, it's uh, not available right now for the subscribers at the end of day service. Just check the box for email alerts when they are triggered and it will send you an email when any alert is triggered in your portfolio for any setting you have put in. Okay, so you can have those emailed to you directly at any time. You really just have to check that box right there, and it'll email to you to the address that we have on file for your subscription account. All right, Robert, so that's uh, where we're going out there. I'm sorry about that. And uh, so that's how you can use the portfolio, use the alerts, set the colors, and request to have them emailed to you as well. Okay, and again, as I mentioned, it's for any stretch. Let's look at the long strangle real quick while we're here. I'll click on view. There we go again, percent position change. Well, let's go back real quick, very quickly here, I'm sorry. Let's go back. Uh, this one, 
has not expired. It's cores. Oh, that's right. They only had monthly. So when they had earnings uh, last month, they had to go out to June because it was after the May expiration. And this particular one's up 136%. Uh, at the time, we bought the, uh, the stock was at around 63. So we bought the 62 and a half put and bought the out of the money 64 call for a $6.35 strangle liquidation profits at 865. Okay. So again, let's just check it. I'll go to alerts by clicking the view. Percent position change. Let's put in an increase of 115. And I'll mark that as green because that's my profit that I want. I want to close the strangle if it's 115. Decrease at 50. I'll mark it as red. Save it. And now look, we're highlighted in green. One of my green alerts has been triggered. Again, I'd click on view there and it would show me that the position's up 136%, which is greater than 115. So I'm at my profit. I wanna go ahead and sell to close this position, take my profit and look for the next strangles that are available. Okay, very good. All right, so that's a review of setting the alerts, what alerts are available. Yes, you can have them emailed to you at any time. Just click the box there for email the alerts when they trigger. And then you're all set. And it'll happen during the day. That program for the email alerts checks, I think, every 1.5 seconds or less. Uh, it's constantly going through the system. Even if I believe you're on 20-minute delayed, it's constantly going through the data uh, to see if an alert has been triggered. All right. Back to the home menu. Oops, sorry, folks. Back to the home menu there. Okay. Now, this is for James. And uh, let's see here. Let's put this on. Okay. Good. This is a question we sort of covered past few weeks, in a sense, but this is going to be much more pointed. Um, okay. So what James wants to know is, is it okay to sell a covered call on a stock you are underwater on? The basic answer to your question, James, is yes if you're right and no if you're wrong. My personal opinion, what I've taught in uh, various webinars on covered call management, in addition to some of the Friday discussions we had a few weeks ago and we were hitting into that sort of market correction period and uh, had that sudden jump down with the new talk of uh, new tariffs in Mexico in addition to ones in China, I'm probably going to take uh, Trex as an example here for a moment. But let's say that a month ago, let's just go to the stock research tool for Trex. Currently at 69.11, jumped up another 221 today. This is something I'm in a merry put on. But let's say about a month ago, right when things started to get hectic, right around May 1st, even though it was probably already hectic then. Uh, that's not the one I want. Let's take a look at the stock chart. And you'll see where I'm going for on this as well. Because I almost did this, by the way. I'm in a married put that's... Pre oh, that's not what I wanted, but it gives you an idea. See, here's sort of the run here. The April low at about 60 went to 59, and then it went up. So let's say we bought here. This is what I was looking for. Right at the end of April, this was an earnings. So let's say after earnings, you, you bought maybe here at 64, and the stock pulled down to 58. Okay, you might have want to sell a covered call here, but then the stock started to move up, it goes here. What do you have to do? I have to buy the 62 call back and roll it up to a 66 or a 67, maybe 68, and then whoop, falls back down to 60. You say, well, let me buy this back for 10 cents, even though I only got 40 cents for the roll, and I'm still at a debit for having to buy this one back, and let me roll down here to the 62, and here we are today at 69.11, five days later. So what do I have to do? I've got to pay seven or eight dollars to buy back this call. What, what's that doing? It's increasing my cost basis. Okay. So that's sort of the danger. And this is a fun stock to look at in this case because it shows you the warning signs of, oh, this looks like it's it's petering out and it's going to be level. So let me just sell a 62, 63 call, a 65 call, for example, and then now you've got to buy it back. And then it plops right after you buy it back and say, okay, let me roll down here because we're now we're down to 58 again. And then whoop, it's right back up to 69, okay? You might know your stock better, James. You might not be seeing it move that often. But that is the risk of sort of selling a call that's down 
because when the market starts to recover, you don't know. I, I know it's tough. We don't necessarily know that. But let's look at it this way. If something comes out on Monday where we're talking about perhaps a, um, a tariff easement, uh, a settling of the tariff easement with uh, Mexico, for example, and the market jumps up 4%, every call that you've sold that's underwater on a declining stock is now going to cost you three, four times more to buy it back, where now you're actually increasing your cost basis and your break even, which may work out if the market continues to move up. I wanted to go to big charts here, but as we saw with Trex, this isn't necessarily the one you want to risk that with. You know, here, sure, it was earnings, but even without the earnings, it's up and down, volatility here and there, kind of tough to pick. Haven't quite seen a Bollinger Band breakout yet, but it's really close, and I like what that MACD is doing. It looks pretty good. Now, didn't a month ago, didn't two months ago, okay? But here we are again with Trex wanting to climb back up. Okay, so what are the alternatives? See, here we're at a profit, but let's say we weren't. Let's say I made the biggest mistake ever, James, and I bought shares of Trex. Instead of doing an options play, uh, anything like that, on or around April 20th, I bought Trex for $76 per share, okay? And knowing that earnings were coming up in two days, but I didn't add a put to it, I didn't uh, try to trade it as a straddle to profit in either direction, I was really bullish, so I just bought 100 shares of stock and thought it was going to go up. And let's say my cost base is 77 now, the stock has recovered, but what did I not want to do, as I mentioned down here? I didn't want to sell a 65 call with my cost basis at 77 because I might get locked into a $12 loss. Of course, right now, that 65 call might cost me 8 or $9, and I might have only gotten a dollar for it. Of course, here, I didn't want to sell a 65 either, knowing what's happened. It's easy for hindsight 2020, but this shows you the risks that are inherent with trying to chase a covered call down. It's actually worse when it comes back up because it costs you more. My cost basis might go up to 83. I took in a dollar, have to pay back seven, adding six dollars to my original cost basis, right? I'm at $83 cost basis right now. That's a tough pill to swallow. So what do I got to do? I can't sell an 85, even with the stock recovering. I might not want to sell a 75 because if it completes this move again next week, it'll be up at 77, my break even right now by the end of next week. Not saying it will, but you know that's a possibility. So, what are the other alternatives that we could do? Well, we have a tool here on Power Options for you uh, that you can use. There's a couple tools and a couple ways that you can use this tool. All right, so the first one, I'm sorry, there, the first one I want to show you, of course, is up here at the top, and it is called the Stock Repair Tool. So let me just put in Trex, and I can click on Stock Repair. This is a really simple tool where you just have to put in your cost basis and your total number of shares. Okay. <clears throat> now what this allows me to do, these are far out in time, but uh, and this is a little bit tougher because Trex does only offer $5 strike differences on standard monthly options. There's no weeklies, there's no single digits. Okay. So this tries to build a simple ratio repair. Buy one call and sell two. How does that work? Well, you can get a credit for you, which is going to lower your cost basis. But look at this first position. Yes, it's out to October. Let's just analyze it for a second. I paid seventy-seven sixty for the stock. If I buy one sixty-five and sell two seventies, I can get a net credit of two sixty. Well, so what? That should drop my break-even down to seventy-four forty. That's not bad, but it's not really great. I mean, the stock's at sixty-nine. But what's this here? It says the break even is 69.70. How does that happen? Well, it's because of the structure of the repair. And let's take a look at the repair details button here for this particular one. I can buy an October 65 for 940. And then I'm going to sell two October 70 calls for $6. So I get $12 back. I get a net credit of 260. But remember, I'm buying 165 and selling 270s. That'd be a ratio spread, wouldn't it? But since you own shares of stock, this is actually a bull call debit spread, five points apart with one bought at 65, one sold at 70, and that extra short call is just a covered call 
against your 100 shares. What does that mean? Nothing's naked, no margin requirement. You could enter this in your broker as selling a call against the stock at 70, sure, which is underwater, but then you're adding a bull call debit spread at 65 and 70. So with only 260 generated, my break even should be about 74.40. Uh, How am I getting a break even at 69.70? Well, at 69.70, I'm still down 730 for my cost basis of 77. I keep that 260 net credit, but this 65 call that I was essentially paid to own, I'm long a 65 call with the stock at 69.70, that's now worth 470. And at 69.70, the two shorts are expiring. So I sell to close the long at 470, sell to close the stock at 69.70, keep 260. I'm at break even, eight points roughly lower, okay, $7.30 lower than my cost basis using the ratio repair. Okay, now, and you say, oh, well, if I just sold the 70 call, I would have gotten $6 and lowered my break even to 71. Right, but if the stock's above 70, you'd still be at a loss of $1, wouldn't you? Yes, we're talking about act to October, but even if you collected that $6, lowered the cost basis down to 71, if the stock went up to 70 and you got assigned, you'd still be at loss of a dollar, or you'd have to roll it. With the repair, if the stock is trading above 70, oh, sorry, let me try that again here. Didn't like that because I was scrolling the screen before it expanded. All right, there we go. See here now, if it's above 70, I'm actually at a profit. Yes, it's only a profit of $60 or 0.8%, but that's at 70. Still seven points below what my initial cost basis was on the position. And here I am at a small profit. Oh, and by the way, I could manage this at expiration too. I could close out my bull call debit spread and get those five points. Let's say the stock's at 71, and I could buy this call back for 71 and move it out to the 75. Now I'm treating it just as a covered call, but I've already lowered my cost basis by the 260 plus the five points for that bull call debit spread that now is in the money, and now I just keep treating this as a covered call position that I continue to roll. And where am I? I'm at 71. I'm still six points below the original cost basis of 77 in a profit zone managing a covered call position. The stock repair tool is very powerful to help you get back to break even faster. Okay, And yes, it does cap the upside, much like just selling the covered call was, but we're doing the repair here so that we can get to break even at better prices. Now, if you run the stock repair and you don't see a repair come up, sometimes you might just see NA, 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 or it might all go out to a January before you see one, okay? Well, what that means is your cost basis might be too high. What can you do in that case? Well, if you have the funds, see with Trex here at 69, let's say, if I bought another 100 shares at 69, I would take my entire cost basis down in the two positions by four points, right? Uh, $77 at 100 share block, 69 at the other, $8 difference. So we'd be at a $73 cost basis on 200 shares. How would that help me? Well, I still see the repairs out for October. It's the same one, but now my break even is 67.70. Guess what? I'm already in the favor. It is not the safest method to average down your cost basis on a stock that's losing in order to sell a call against it, but it can help the position get back to break even faster. Using averaging down, because you are you know, increasing the risk if the stock continues to fall, but averaging down and using the stock repair can get you to a quick profitable zone on the position. And my, I was hoping what I'd see here, by the way, is that we'd see some, uh, June was optimistic, but I'd see some July or maybe some September repairs come in. I think it's July and August for Trek. September's not available yet, um, instead of just the October ones. That's what I was hoping for with the average down, but it didn't come up in this case. Okay, so 
Remember, anytime you can go to our free webinars page. I'll send everyone the link. It's powerop.com slash webinars.asp. Some of the more recent webinars have been uh, uh, blocked out and are available only for subscribers and trial members, but this is a public page. You can look at some of our other information. Where I'm going with this, James, is uh, go to powerop.com slash webinars.asp. Click on the options concepts tab. Yeah, options concepts, excuse me. And the third one down is manage your broken position. This webinar discusses alternative methods for managing a stock position that has fallen in price, a covered call that has moved against you, managing a sold put that is in the money or the stock has been put to you, or possibly managing a bullish spread position, bull put credit, bull call debit. You'll see some other discussion and examples of the stock repair tool compared to just selling a call against it, the pros and cons of averaging down to look for a potential stock repair if one doesn't appear, and there's a couple other ideas and concepts that are discussed, as well as some warnings you might consider when using the stock repair or selling a call well below your cost basis to try to manage the position long term. So that's a little bit of homework you might check out this weekend for more ideas. Remember, check out that stock repair tool. Just put in your stock symbol here and then click on stock repair up at the top. That's also available in the signature tools section, the volatility skew tool, market sentiment, which we looked at earlier, spread chain, long option finder, stock repair, the insurance tool. If you're in the opposite position, you have a stock that's up in price, you want to try to lock in some of the unrealized gains to have a no-risk position, that's what the insurance tool is for as well. Uh, and the strike of pain tool uh, also is there, sort of a pinning tool based on the max pain calculation um, from uh, several years ago. You know, while we're here, let's just go ahead and take a look at that insurance tool. So the opposite scenario, let's say that uh, when the market started to show some legs <laughs> the past uh, 42, 48 hours or so, but showed a little bit of legs here and there, let's say that I actually bought Trex at $65 per share. Let's call it 64 earlier this week, Wednesday, for example, uh, into Thursday. So here I am, the stock's at 69.11. I could take a $5 profit just by liquidating, but if I think there's room for more upside, but I'm worried about the potential any day announcement of new tariffs, new this, new that, uh, another Russian Navy destroyer running within 100 meters of a guided missile uh, U.S. Navy ship <laughs> somewhere overseas, of course, anything of that nature that could bring the market down, here's what I'll do. Go to the insurance tool. You can find in the signature tools tab, also under the married put tab as well. Put in my cost base for shares at $64, and I'm just going to leave the buy put month at all expirations. Okay. Now, what did this tool do? It immediately went out in that short time period, and it grabbed for me all the potential put options I could buy against the stock. So right now, I have an 8% unrealized profit in the stock. But I could buy, let's say, an 80 put for July, 42 days out. 1095, that looks expensive. I wouldn't do this one, but let's talk about it anyway. So my total cost base would be 7495 but I have an 80 put, guaranteed 80 back, which means I've locked in a profit of 6.7% on the trade. Trex could fall back down to 58. I'm guaranteed 6.7% profit. It could go up to 85. I'm going to do better, right? This one's too far for me. It's too far out of the money, okay? Meaning that I don't probably have a speculation in 42 days that Trex will hit 80. If it does, my married put's going to be looking fantastic. That stock repair would look pretty good too. We'd manage one of those short calls as it was moving up above 70 and just take the full profit on the debit spread. But again, it's too far. I probably want to be closer to somewhere with a stock at 69, around the 70 strike, maybe the 65. And if I'm holding the position longer term, for example, I want to stay in until maybe uh, October, but let's just, uh, you know, let's just look at some of these other ones here. Let's just look at July, for example. Is it July I wanted? Yeah. So here, although it's not great, the 70 put, you know, right where the stock is at the money is at 261. 
but this would give me a guaranteed profit of 3.7% no matter what Trex does from here on out. And if it keeps going above 70, I could realize more of a profit. This is what we'd call a bulletproof trade. Locked in profit means negative maximum risk. I pay 216 for that 70, I'm sorry, 350. My apologies for that 70 put. I have a total cost basis of 6750, but the least amount of money I can get back is 70. Guaranteed a profit of 3.7%. So if it pulls back down to 61, $58, I didn't lose that $8. I'm still making some profit on the position instead of being underwater. And that's with a cost basis of $64, of course. But if it goes up to 72, 73, 75, 77, it continues this move, I still have further upside with no chance of loss. And if I wanted to, I could still sell a call against it to increase this, maybe cap my gain a little bit, but that might be okay. All right, so that's what the insurance tool does for you. Now, I know many of us might not, many of you, if you've recently bought stock in the last 60 days, you might not be looking at a profit on your position. However, it's always good if you're worried about market conditions, if you've been holding shares of stock for years and selling covered calls against them. I mean, you've got a very low cost basis on Apple or um, you know, Amazon, well, not Amazon, but maybe you do have a low cost basis on Amazon, uh, Netflix, anything along those lines, any stock, any stock, like even Johnson Johnson, you've been trading for years and collecting the dividends, you have a lower cost basis, but you're worried about more penalties and more declines after that recent uh, settlement and lawsuit that came out, use the insurance tool. Put in your stock, put in your cost basis if you have an unrealized profit, see which puts you might be able to buy 40, 50, 80, 150 days out in time where you can lock in a fair portion of your unrealized profit at this time, have no risk on the trade for that time period, and you'll still be able to sell calls against it or do other adjustments on the position knowing that you've locked in at least some, if not most, of your unrealized gain at this moment. The stock repair tool and the stock insurance tool are used for different scenarios, but they're both extremely powerful tools. One helps you get to break even faster on a position, a covered call, a stock, or a uh, naked put where the stock was put to you that you're underwater on, helps you get back to break even faster. The insurance tool, if you've got some gains but you're worried about hesitancy in the market, or hey, maybe you've even got earnings coming up. You want to try to lock in some profit if the earnings completely disappoint. Um, what was one of the big ones yesterday? Uh, was it GameStop? I don't know. I think most people have been trading GameStop uh, continuously unless they were playing it bearish. But again, GameStop took a huge hit yesterday and a couple of the, um, what do you call them? Uh, my apologies. Uh, a couple of the uh, brokers, of course, and analysts, uh, you know, one person essentially said, run away, the uh, the beds are burning and the stock is bleeding. It's a total dumpster fire. We're just gone. Um, set their target down to about from 750 I think, to $4 per share. Just said, stay away from it. Don't even play it bearish. Just stay away from the whole thing. So that, that took a dump. Uh, it took a hit. <laughs> Let's see where it is today. I didn't see what happened to GME today. Um, the earnings were bad and there's uh, no real... Uh, down another 11 cents. So it's a 502. That's not as, as low as it thought. Um, but I don't know if anyone's been following it. This it's just been lower left. Uh, I'm sorry, upper left to lower right for the past, I think almost a year now. And they tried to restructure. They brought in new uh, management. Oh no, they were doing pretty good there. And it was only $16, but they were doing pretty good there. And once that first earnings decline hit, it just kept going down. And you see here, that wasn't even related to October, November, and December. That decline was here and it started to come back up. And then here we are, that first earnings that it had. Why did it drop so much? Well, it dropped so much because all the business is going to streaming uh, online gaming. You can basically, from any console, download a game directly from the service, right? So. Uh, Xbox, excuse me, PlayStations, they're all plugged in. You can get the games right from the platform. You don't need to go buy a game at GameStop or trade in anything anymore. And that's starting to show. So it was from $8 down to about $5, and it's continued to drop to that $5 range there. Um, so anyway, you know, there's something to be said about when to not continue to repair a position or try to manage it. Sometimes you just have to cut your losses. 
But again, if I was in GameStop for whatever reason, I stayed in and this kept going down. I was trying to repair it with covered calls and I knew I had earnings coming up. I likely would have bought in one or two puts on this heading into earnings almost to create a synthetic straddle on the position, even though I was still long shares of stock. Uh, of course, if I was long shares of stock, I'd buy two puts to create that straddle. So if it goes up, I'm still okay. If it goes down, hey, at least I'm not in this zone again. But at least buying one put would have given me something, would have given me some floor on this position, unlike a stop order just would have been violated and that earnings announcement as soon as the market opened the next day. I know there were bigger declines in the market, but this one was the one that stood out to me just because when I read the article, I can't remember the last time I saw an analyst essentially say, there's blood in the water, um, the beds are burning, and uh, this thing is just bleeding. Don't even trade it bearish, just get away. Don't trade it, period. Just get away. <laughs> I think I can't remember the last time I saw that uh, from an actual analyst uh, that was written up. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's 5.20 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, I just want to remind everyone we still have some time. If anyone has any last-minute questions, uh, of course, regarding any of the tools we saw today, limited risk structure, um, we want to talk about any management techniques, uh, rollout opportunities on positions or more. Just go ahead and send those to us as well. Um, let's see. Last week, we reviewed some of the changes I subtly made to the Iron Condor search um, for the weeklies. Let's just take a look at those, see where they stand. Let's go to other strategies. I took Iron Condors off. So let me go ahead and remove the calendar put for the time being. Add iron condors. Here's the, uh, by the way, there's that uh, list of the 23 or so strategies that we support here on Power Options. I'm going to add iron condor back in. Okay, all right. Let's save that. And let's go to iron condor and let's go to search. Oh, so ignore that. Oh, that's interesting. That is very interesting. So we just expanded these. Oh, that's, there's too many results. <laughs> that's always brilliant. Okay, so that's important to know. I'm going to have to make an adjustment on that as well. There we go. So the weeklies are looking pretty good. There's 18 good weekly iron condor positions uh, based on our criteria there. So I just wanted to take a look to see how those were doing. But I'm going to have to adjust the initial values uh, once more. All right. Okay. Fantastic. Let's see here. Scroll up for a minute. David says, I have a trade going well. Purchased a June 19 LRCX 180 call. It sold a June LRCX 182.50. Okay, so we're in a bull call debit spread. Um, and they did this on Thursday. If the stock was to go back to near 180 next week, what would be a standard way to try to salvage some of the trade through expiration? And these are Junes. Okay, fantastic. And this was on Thursday. Okay, so let's do this. I'm going to go to the chain for LCRX. David, I don't need the specific numbers, but I'm going to try to get close to it. Let's just go to the chain. I knew I was going to do that. I knew it. I knew it. LRCX. My apologies. All right. And for the June 19 standard expiration, June 21st, I believe. You said June, right? Yeah, June 19 expiration. Standard. All right. So this is the standard. Make sure I've got this right, David. Okay. So I'm going to assume you did the standard Junes. Uh, I don't know if you did the weeklies that expire the 14th. I'm going to assume standard at this time. I think I just got to comment in on that one second. Okay, good. Now, this is today, yesterday, June 21st expiration, 180 call, midpoint, let's call the buy at about 7.15. And the 182.50 midpoint, let's call it, let's be nice to ourselves. We're going to call that a 5 60 maybe a 555 is more fair okay just wanted to check the prices that were they were yesterday so let's go ahead now that you might have different prices that's fine we're going to be pretty close here i'm going to add in my options spread for june 19th or 21st excuse me and 
Was I looking at the right? Yes, I was. 180, 182.50 calls. We bought the 180. This is a debit spread at 715, let's say. Sold the 182.50, 555. It's about $1.60 net debit on a 250 spread. Nice strong return. The stock's up at 186.68. All right. Now, the question. If it was to go back near to 180 next week, what would be a standard way to try to salvage some of the trade through expiration? Okay. Now, I'm going to treat this the same way I treat a bull put credit spread. Debit spreads are subtly different. There's a We actually lose a management technique I could have in the debit spreads over the, the credit spreads, but that's okay. If possible, David, what I attempt to do is focus on my trigger point. What's my trigger point? It's within about one or one and a half percent of my short option strike price. This is my pivot. I don't necessarily want it to get down to here. I want to manage it if the stock sort of gets within one percent or drops one percent below the short option strike price. Okay, that's my pivot in this case, in, in this spread here. Now, we can't always have that. LRCX, as you mentioned, might open down Monday $6.30, and you're right at 180 That's a different scenario. So the first thing is, I would try to manage it before it goes to 180 And you said if it pulls back to 180 next week. Yes, and 182.50 is close to 180 181 is close to 180 I understand. But I want to sort of use this as my pivot point. If the stock reaches within maybe, uh, this is only a two-week spread, I'd say maybe half a percent okay, of our 182 strike. And that might even be too much. And you think about it, that's about, um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, within 90, 80 cents a dollar or so in that range, okay? So, but that's all right, 183.50, we're still really close to that. How would I manage it? One of the management techniques I might use is not available on this one, and that's okay. It's going to be perfectly fine. One of the first things I might do is if the stock starts to pull back here, I may be able to buy to close your 182.50 call and sell to open a call at a lower strike price that's not 180. We don't have that opportunity, that option here, it's fine. If you're in the 185, for example, 180 and the stock started to fall to 185, I might buy to close my 185 and then sell a 182.50. It would shorten my profit, but it would give me more cushion and room before I started getting in the money on the short call. Okay, now, so option number one, I'm just going to outline them for you. I'm not going to say which one is the best. Uh, the first two aren't the best, and you'll hate them, but we always have to talk about it. Number one, close the position, even if it's for a small loss, except that it's going to be one of the maybe um, 10 or 15% debit spreads or credit spreads that you're going to lose in your portfolio over the year of your trading plan. You know, if you usually have an 85, 88% success rate, except this is going to be one of the 12 out of 100 that you're going to lose. Close, take the loss, move on to a new position. No one wants to do that. But again, if the stock's going down this way and it's going against me, it might be better to take a 20, 30% loss of the max debit as opposed to wait. And then suddenly a day later, you find you're pretty much near the maximum loss and an 80% loss in the thing. Okay. Two, this is the one that you can't do in the debit spread. I'm not even going to mention it as number two. My second approach, if I'm in a bull put credit spread, which is a parity trade, is if the stock starts to fall, all the indicators I use to get in the position go against me. Stock now falls below the 20-day moving average, has a negative MACD crossover. What I may do in that case in the credit spread is buy to close the short and leave the long open. Because if it continues to fall, that long put is going to continue to gain. Can't do this in the debit spread because the call doesn't continue to increase in value, it loses. That's not going to help you. And what I would never suggest, of course, is selling to close the short, my apologies, selling to close the long and leaving the naked call open. Too risky, don't do that. All right? So let's go back to square one. One is close. You're probably not going to do that, and I have no problem with that, but sometimes it's better to take a partial loss than take the whole loss. Number two, the standard. Close your spread and it will be at a small loss perhaps, and then roll down and out 
maybe even to the next expiration. Roll down, of course. So what would I do? I'd buy to close the short, sell to close the long, and then I may sell a 180 and buy a 177.50. You may go out to July in this case as a repair. So roll down and potentially out. This is a common adjustment that's taught. And it's common because when who, who trades spreads? Well, with trade spreads, it's usually someone who traded covered calls and then started learning more, played with some strangles, maybe some calendar spreads, the quote unquote poor man's covered call, and now has delved into vertical spreads to appreciate the leverage and know what they're doing as long as they're disciplined. I don't like this one because what happened? I got into a bull call debit spread or bull put credit spread that I thought the stock was going to move up. Something happened and the direction is not doing what I want. So whenever you roll down and out even, although you may be able to repair it if it stays level, what you're also going to do is increase the risk. You're going to have a new debit plus the loss you took on the original. So you're going to have a smaller profit, bigger width here, not necessarily bigger width even, but bigger loss potential there because of the loss you already realized. And if the stock continues to move down against you, this is just not going to be a successful pattern to continue to roll. It's an opportunity if you think that it was over market overreaction, for example, that this weakness on LRCX was just based on something that was outside, a geopolitical thing, global economy, not related to the strengths of the stock. That might be okay. Number three in this case, I could close the position for a loss and, hey, do the opposite, right? What do I mean by that? Well, it's starting to move against me. I close the bull call debit spread and then do what? Open a bear put debit spread on the stock that's declining in value. Oh, sorry. So in that case now, if it continues down, I'm not getting this continued loss by moving to a new bull call debit. I'm actually primed in the position where I continue this. Another option here is what I call the pendulum adjustment. So the stock's moving against you. Rather than doing number three, what you might be able to do with the pendulum adjustment is, yes, sell to close the 180. As the stock was, don't do this until it goes below your short strike, and it's about maybe a little bit close to halfway between your strikes, and it looks like it's continuing against you. S look to sell to close the 180 and buy the 185. What have you done now? You've converted with one option move, one roll, ah, sorry, you've converted your bull call debit into a bear call credit. Potentially, you have to check the numbers naturally. The return will be lower, but now as the stock continues to move down, you're in the right position. And you didn't even move the short option. You just swung the long option to create a bear call credit spread. Cheaper commissions than number three. That's what saves you on the pendulum adjustment. But again, if the stock recovers and moves back up, you're in that situation as well. Okay. I, I'm not a fan of this either, uh, depending. So here, here's my four. Uh, there's a couple others too. It's just, you know, it's close, close, roll down and out. We talked about that. Close and do the opposite. The results on commissions, do the pendulum adjustment. Number five, um, create mark mark has this the same thought but what number five is usually actually this is usually number four and then five is the pendulum but create a condor an all call condor or an all call butterfly why i'm not really fond of this one is because although it will increase the upper and lower break even it still has the same problem with number two. If the stock's continuing to fall, you're still taking a loss, okay? But it is still the opportunity. Now, I'm going to clear off all these drawings. Jot these down real quick. One, close the position. If it falls down towards 180, take the loss. Accept it as one of the 12% or 13% you're going to lose over the course of the year or your trading plan, right? Hopefully, with your debits and credits, you're seeing a sort of uh, 83, 85% success rate, maybe 88%. So take this one of the 12 or 15% that you're going to lose on. Save it from getting larger losses. You could always roll down and out. We talked about 
what can happen with that? Of course, if it does recover and you were right, hey, you're still good in a profitable position. Close and do the opposite if your sentiment has changed or consider using the pendulum adjustment to save yourself commissions. Roll the long out to take your bull call debit into a bear call credit. And then number five, create a condor or butterfly. All right, so what would that look like? Let's click on this. We're going to take Mark's uh, move first. And it's probably the one that's going to give you the best reduction, I guess I want to say, or best increase to upper and lower break even is the butterfly itself because uh, you're going to be at the money. So what would I do in this case? Well, you've already got one component of the butterfly, the call butterfly, an all-call butterfly. You've got the bull call debit spread. What I could do now is sell another 182.50 and buy the 185. We'll use today's prices. It might be a little bit lower if the stock's trading at, say, 181, as we were talking about, or 183. I wouldn't do this right now. But so, yeah, I'm going to lower the prices. We're going to say if the stock fell to 183-ish, okay, that this would probably be, we're going to use these numbers, uh, 370 for the 182.5 and, and 260. All right, so we're going to sell this at 370, buy this at 260. Another additional, now you're getting a net credit of 110. So your total cost will only be 50 cents, but you may have to cover the margin requirement on the other side. Okay, so we paid $1.60 for the debit in. We're going to get $1.10 by adding this bear call to create the butterfly. However, we have to put up 250. Why? Because even though you've got two long legs, this is still you still have to put up this 250 here because you're short two at 182.50 and long one at 185 and 180. Okay, so this this difference here, you've got to cover that monetary requirement. Max profit increases. The max risk still is only fifty dollars, so we're still pretty good there. In fact, we're better than we were at 160. And the upper and lower well, I should say the lower break even moved down because of the initial net credit you took in, but now we also have an upper break even. Again, we're saying if the stock was at 183, not where it is right now, you wouldn't do this. Okay, so this is a butterfly repair. It's potential, but again, you still could take a loss on the downside, but as Mark's saying, it's, it's less than what it originally was with just the debit spread as well. Okay, and then you do end up with an upper break even. The other approach, of course, is to instead of do the all call butterfly, which has now a tight window. So if there's a sudden drop on Monday and it drops down to 182, we panic and do the butterfly and the next day it jumps up to 189, you know, that's a little rough. But the same thing would happen if we did the condor. In this case, what I would do is a very similar structure to the butterfly repair. We just go further out of the money. Right? I'd go with the 187 and a half, 190 right now. That's actually too close. I'm going to go 190, 192 and a half. It was just still probably too close. <laughs> but in any case, so if I do this now, uh, we're getting a net credit about 80 cents. That's not too bad. Well, so now you've got this 180.78, not as low as the all call butterfly repair, which was at 180.40, if memory serves correctly. And of course, we do have an upper break even, but it's higher. It's at 191. Now you're in a condor position, but again, you would have to put up the 250 between 190 and 19250, but you decrease the total risk from 160 down to 7850 because that extra 80 or so net credit you received on the upside. So that's a potential repair. The prices will be different as it falls down, but using a condor or the butterfly can help lower the lower break even for you. You would create an upper break even, which is true. You may lower the overall risk, but what doesn't it do? It doesn't stop the loss from happening if it continues down. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's see. Let me go back here. James, uh, so I'm sorry, there we go with that. I'm sorry, uh, David, that's what I would consider those five points I mentioned there, as well as what we just saw here, Mark's comment on the butterfly or the condor repair as well. Real quick before I get to our last uh, couple of questions, one from James, one from Martin. As we showed before, 
Let's go back to the webinar section. Uh, click on option strategies this time. I have some here on uh, sorry managing your spread positions. I prefer seven ways to manage credit or debit spreads, pros and cons of each. You can scroll through that one a little bit, David, and go to the bull call spreads and uh, see what's a more in-depth conversation of some of the triggers that are used, the pros and cons of the management techniques. But in that one, we discuss all four, bull put credit, bull call debit, um, bear put debit, and bear call credit. So managing your spread positions, uh, that's one you can take a look at as well. All right, James, uh, apologies here. It's, it's, uh... All right, in a bullish market, what do you know? I guess no. It says, what do you know? Or it says, what do you about? But I think it means, what do you know? What do you know about buying a 20 delta call? Okay. With a two or three uh, DTE and closing and within an hour, if it goes against you, if you reach your target of one or two dollars. James, I'm just going to be flat honest. Nothing. I don't day trade options. I don't ever plan on day trading options. What is a bullish market? You get, you wake up in the morning, you see at 7.15 that the Dow futures are saying, hey, it's going to be up 170 points like it was the other day. Okay, what happens when the market opens? You want to place your trade. The jump's already there, all right? But you think it's going to last for a while. Guess what? It didn't. Um, so you see that jump in the morning. You try to get your buyer call in at a 20 delta cheap out of the money option. Very quickly, you get filled and then at... You get filled at 940, and then at 945, 950, the market starts to ease back by 10, up, comes back up to about 1010, and then eases back down by 1015. That's actually what happened, I believe, it was Thursday um, in the situation. So you hit your trigger loss because you, you don't necessarily want to lose 100% unless that's what you're doing. You hit your trigger loss more often than not before you get to the gain. Okay. So I don't play the open with options. I don't. Because if the market jumps up suddenly, even if I try to get my order in at 9.30 and 30 seconds, the bid-ask spread is going to be wide because the market's still trying to trigger everything and churn the money that's moving it. Okay, I know some people teach this out there. It's not something I do. Usually at that time, I'm still, uh, I can't say uh, wrist deep or I can't say elbow deep in emails because you're never really doing anything physical that you're just typing. So I'm finger deep into the emails from customers and of course may have a coaching session at 10 o'clock as well. I personally don't do that. I don't day trade that way. I don't think I will ever day trade options in my life. Okay, I look more for longer term positions or positions that expire at least five to eight days out. I don't even trade the two day out uh, if it's Wednesday, I don't trade the Friday SPYs, or if it's Friday, I don't trade the Mondays, and if it's Monday, I don't trade the Wednesdays. I don't trade those two-day spreads and everything on SPY or anything like that. Okay. One thing I can comment that I know of is there's two schools of thought, and over my 17 or so years of teaching options, I've seen it come forward, leave, come back, come back the opposite direction, and so forth. And what I'm talking about is there are are always, there is always a group that is teaching one way to buy calls and puts, and there's another group that at the same time that's teaching you the other way to buy long calls and puts. Okay, and what are the two ways? Someone out there will be teaching you to buy long calls that are at least 60 to 50 days out in time with a delta maybe of greater than 0.6 or 0.7 in the money hoping for growth on bullish positions. They'll say that they don't have an 80% success rate, which you can usually get with bull put credit spreads and bull call debit spreads as we've seen. But they say, hey, we're usually right about 60 to 5% of the time, which is still really good for buying in the money calls, trust me. Now, the key is though, is that when they're wrong, because they, had, they bought into intrinsic value, when the stock fell, they lost a little bit, not 100%. At the same time, there'll be a group out there on the internet. You'll see ads for them. They'll be teaching buying calls. Let's just take team as an example here. Let's go to the profit and loss chart. So instead of buying, you know, the, the team here is at 131.43. This is a 135 slightly at the money. There'll be some groups talking about at the money. 
but you'll have a group that's out there saying, hey, Teams at 131 has looked really strong. We're going to buy an inexpensive weekly option. We're going to go to the 145 strike for 15 cents. So even if we're wrong in five days, what are we going to lose? We're going to lose 18 cents. Not a problem. But hey, if it goes up to 150 in the next five days and we get $5 of profit, you just made a $4,000 profit on your position. And they will claim that they're going to be right only about 15, probably only 10 to 15% of the time. Okay. In my 17 years, when there's a bullish market, I've seen both. The ones that go in the money and say, hey, we're going to be right 65% of the time. But when we're wrong, we're not going to lose that much, and this will be profitable long term. And then you'll have the ones doing the cheap out of the money, delta of 0.2 or 20, as you mentioned. And they are only going to be right 10 to 15% of the time. Just the hope is, is that when they're right and they get that 200, 300, 400% profit, it counters 90% of the time they lost with the cheap options. <laughs> Most investors I talk to say, oh, that sounds great when they read an advertisement. Then when they see that they're actually going to be wrong 90% of the time, they back away. I'm not saying you're going to be wrong 90% of the time, James. I'm saying trying to day trade options with those quick movements is really risky, and you probably will be wrong more often than right with the hope that when you are right, the gains will counter the losses that you take. Now, yes, I see the third range out there, and I never believe it personally. No one's ever proven it to me. No one's been able to show me a track record. Just as you guys see on a daily basis, I see services out there that will say, hey, we made 400% today on XYZ, or we made 400% this week on XEZ. Our four-day trade on ABC made 310%. Um, we've been trading these lo weekly long calls and have a 90% success rate. No company that has ever said that, even when weeklies weren't around and they were talking about monthlies, no one has ever been able to prove on a consistent basis that they're right 90% of the time buying call options. There might have been 10 or 15 of these calls that were rolled and aren't closed yet. So they're not counting them as a loss, but they're not winning yet. It's just not realized, right? So what they're saying is they only take a realized loss 10% of the time in the hope that what they rolled out to three, four months down the road is gonna be profitable. Okay, so just be wary of that when you're looking at different services and you're seeing different numbers and they say, hey, this guy looks so much better than any other thing I've seen out there. That's when you have to be careful. Okay, and that's when you have to be very wary of what's out there in the market. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, again, I'm not really, um, James, this is not uh, my forte. Um, and it's, it's really difficult for me. And Martin says, uh, yeah, buying short-term calls is a fail program. That's what Martin's comment is before I get to his other question. Uh, and I have never seen anyone consistently be successful buying three or four day out options on those situations. It's, it's never seen it consistent. Sam, who I think is on vacation, I'm not sure, but Sam used to join us for these webinars on a, on a regular basis and he's been in and out. I think he's actually on vacation, but long story short, Something he does where he's been very successful at based on his word and has sent me some of the emails of some of his trades is he goes and on stocks he's slightly bullish on but not sure. Instead of just buying a call one week out, he'll buy sort of a strangle, sort of an out of the money call and an out of the money put on the same stock that's maybe three cycles out, maybe 40 days, 50 days out. And he's planning on selling near term calls and puts against that sort of like a double diagonal, a double calendar spread, but he's not usually selling the call and the put at the same time. Based on his indicators, the market's moving up, he's selling a put. If it looks like it's going bearish, he'll sell the call and buy back the short put. He's leaving those two longs out there uh, as protection and to gain profit as the strangle, and then he'll roll one in and out, and he's maybe out of it after two or three sells. But you know, he would usually say the same thing. He's never bought a call, even when he was wildly bullish, three, four, five days out in time because eventually you just get that erosion of time value so quickly. All right. <clears throat> now, sorry, Martin, to your question. Thank you for your comment, Martin, about uh, your experience with buying those calls too. But your real question, 
when entering the married put, when buying a married put, okay, following the radioactive trading techniques we discuss in the blueprint uh, for the limited risk, a long-term stock play, but a limited risk controlled gain, and the put's actually a second, uh, it's not really just insurance, it's not that we buy it and the money disappears, it's a uh, second asset that works in our favor as the stock goes up and down, but in any case, oh, okay, we teach, let me just go to the search, that'll help. Okay. All right. So you see here, Altesian came up again, still being bullish. 131.43. Following our criteria discussed in the blueprint, if I was to purchase Altesian, T E A M, today as a radioactive married put, we'll say November, Martin, instead of December, because that's what came up, I'd buy likely the November 140, which would give me a. Debit of 152.63. Yes, that's my break even, but only at November expiration. And it only carries a risk of 12.63 or 8.3%. Martin, I might go with the 145 in this case, but look, that's still in the money. We're nine points in the money here. All right, so let me go ahead and go to the profit. Oh, shoot. Go to the profit and loss chart. All right, so this at midpoint, it comes out to 8.1. I like my risk around 7, 7.5% at the max. This is a little high for me, but we'll use it as an example. And I am going in the money on the position. Okay, now I already do have a video on this subject. Okay, and you say, is it better to buy the put more ITM versus ATM to raise the ba even basis? Okay. So there's two schools of thought on this. I actually, this is too high of a risk for me, but here's the deal. Why wouldn't I just buy a 130 because it's cheaper? Okay, I did this recently. I'm gonna, I have to keep November. I did this recently. I'll have to hunt it down for you. But it was quite fascinating when you looked at what happened. Okay, so here we're at the money. Stocks at 131, I'm buying the 130 for 1545. The risk goes up only to 11.5%. Still too rich for my blood, but it only went up 3.4%. And again, only at November expiration in either scenario, if we held the position all the way to November, did no adjustments. If the stock was below 130, we'd lose 11.5. If the stock was below 130, I'd lose 8.1 on the in the money 140. Part of the problem with going at the money or out of the money, out of the money, of course, this would go higher because the insurance doesn't kick in until you get further down. You didn't pay any intrinsic value. It was all time value. And so when you're out of the money and the stock moves up, what's happening? You're losing all the time value on the position. Remember one of the rules, and that's the ATM bell curve. That's a terrible bell curve. <laughs> but essentially, what does it tell us? It tells us that the at the money strike for any option at any expiration always has the highest time premium. And we're talking about puts here. So as I go higher strikes, deeper in the money, I have a higher cost, but I'm paying lower time premium. And out of the money is also lower time premium, but no intrinsic value. So what happens when the stock moves up? This also shifts. So when it goes up to 140, my 140 strike now has the highest time value. The 130 out of the money has the lowest, and if I bought the 120 to be cheap, it has no time value remaining. It's declining faster. What does that mean? As a second working asset, I'm in a better position now because the time value actually swelled. Yes, I lost some intrinsic, but at the 130 strike, you didn't have any intrinsic and you lost all time value. You're lower on the scale. And if you went out of the money, you have, you're at the very low end of that ATM bell curve. Okay. And if you go too deep in the money, you know, if I go up to the 150 or the 160, yes, I'd have a much lower risk on the trade. But guess what? Now I have a much lower expectancy of any profit because I started over here. So even if the stock moves up, I'm only here on the ATM bell curve in here. I'm holding a lot of intrinsic, which is still losing as it's moving up. But again, that's why we prefer to buy one or two strikes in the money to keep that risk around that five to 6% range 
in that case, okay? Buying more in the money is risky because yes, you're gonna have a lower risk and you're gonna shift to the break even, which is gonna lower your expectancy of profit. And going out of the money, if the stock moves up, it's harder to use the put as that second asset because you didn't have any intrinsic to begin with, you're losing time value and that's just decaying and you're going on the wrong end of that ATM bell curve where you can still use it to your uh, address there as well, okay, um, to, to help you with the position for the management. That's why we select the put that we do. I can't remember if it was two weeks ago or one week ago when we were having a discussion related to the married put positions. I'll look it up for you. But what we saw is that when you went out of the money and the stock moved up, yes, you saw more of a profit, but you had such you lost more percentage-wise on the put, and it was harder to manipulate as a second asset to use the income methods taught in the blueprint, the three or four that revolve manipulating the put option to be in your favor. And if you went too deep in the money, all you do is lose intrinsic. The time value kind of holds because, again, too deep in the money as buying initially, you're way over here. Okay, so as the stock's moving, you're just going into this direction. You're not gaining time value and you're losing more intrinsic. But when I buy right about here and I get that 3, 4, or 5% movement as I wanted, now I'm at the height of the time value on the put that I bought. I can sell that now into time value and buy cheaper time value. And that's why that income method number four works all the time to reduce the risk. Too far in the money, you lower expectancy and it's harder to manipulate. Too far out of the money, yeah, you have a higher theta decay and um, you don't have any intrinsic to start with. Okay. All right. So that's, that's where we get caught up in that as well. Oh, yeah, and that, that's always the truth. That's the other reason uh, for those of you that might be looking at this thing. Why did he even look at November for a put option? And it's because just a comment that uh, Martin just gave back to us here is this. Uh, sorry, he says, I own the blueprint. Good explanation. Uh, I'll send you an email. Also, great, Martin. I'll look for that. Uh, people often think that the puts are expensive. Insurance. They are if you buy it cheap and short term. See, if I just bought the June option, the 130 strike, the at the money, it might only cost me 2 to $3. But if I want to stay in the position, then I have to buy the July, the August, the September, the October, and then the November. That's six months at $3. That's a cost of $18. The far output at the same strike, the six-month output compared to June, well, five months out from June expiration to November expiration is nowhere near five times the cost. That's just the nature of options. You pay less per day. And in the first, that's the other comparison we did on that webinar I was talking about, Martin. What we did is we said, what's the difference between buying a June 130 and buying the November 130? Well, in 10 days from now, or let's say even the July, okay, 42 days out, buying the July 130 versus the November. Well, 20 days from now, on the 27th of June, even if the stock stays where it is, I'm only losing, theoretically, based on the Black-Scholes pricing model, a dollar on my November series that I paid $15 for. The July 130 right now, let's take a look. Is it 860? All right, so 42 days out is 860 versus 160 days out, four times the amount of time is not even twice the cost. Shorter term is more expensive for insurance, as we were talking about. But here, let's just put this one in, all right? So this is what we're talking about, the long-term insurance to start, at least 150 days out as a general rule. I know the spread isn't gonna look right, the profit and loss chart, but here's what I wanna see. Again, 627, stock stays at 131.43. Volatilities are about the same. I'm going to lose $230 on the July 130 call and only lose a dollar on the November. Less theta decay, less time decay until we get in those last 90 days as well. Okay? All right. So that's, that, that's one of the things we talked about in that one as well as such the thing as Martin is too deep in the money. James asks, what is the blueprint? James, the blueprint is uh, a full trading methodology here. Um, 
And you can check it out. Uh, it's at the store there, the, the store. Ignore this price here. That's uh, because I'm signed into my account. But the blueprint, what it does is it talks about the initial structure of that limited risk position, why it's beneficial to use the married put in the proper structure long term to avoid the lie of leverage and avoid the risk. And then it delves into the 12 different income methods I alluded to on that married put structure. So as the, I'm sorry, um, there we go. So if I open this married put initially, there's 12 different ways that we use, including you know, gener selling premium to generate income, leaving the upside open, but still generating income to lower this initial at risk, uh, I can manipulate the second asset, the put. So there's 12 different adjustments we use in this protected structure to lower this initial at risk, increase the potential profit, and potentially do what we saw earlier, James, with that stock insurance tool, bulletproof the trade while still having a few months or several months to go of insurance with no risk on the trade. That's what we call bulletproofing. So that's what the blueprint is. You can check it out on Power Options. It is a full trading technique around the proper way to trade a married put position to not worry about stop orders anymore, to have a properly structured trade in place first, to avoid the lie of leverage, stack the market odds in your favor with still the ability to trade regularly against that initial protected structure to generate income lower the risk and potentially bulletproof the trade. Of course, you can also see that full information, uh, radioactivetrading.com. Here, here's what you should probably do. If you haven't done so yet, go to radioactivetrading.com and just put in your first and last name and email address and click get the sketch. It's a free white paper that discusses uh, the initial structure and what's possible with radioactive trading techniques, no obligation whatsoever. Uh, Martin says the blueprint has been taught at some business schools. Yes, yeah. Uh, Kurt actually talked about the um, uh, presented the ideas of the radioactive trading taking the blueprint at MIT and a couple of other places as well. In addition to that, also. Uh, let's see. Valon says stocks in utilities and REITs. Oh, sorry. Stocks and utilities and REITs don't move that much compared to tech stocks. Does the cost of the married put be taken into consideration? Well, on a thing like a REIT, you can almost go right at the, you still want to go further out in time if you're planning a longer term hold. But in that case, you could probably go right at the money and only have a 2% risk. But the issue comes with not necessarily the structure. Okay. This is a bullish play. Oh, that was the bulletproof one. Sorry. This is a bullish play. It's a neutral to bullish position. And as you can see, Oh, sorry, guys. As you can see from the, the profit and loss chart there, this is that one we're carrying the 11.5% risk. Oh, that's the one third. I, this is the one I wouldn't use. Sorry. But in general, it's the neutral to bullish position. I'm still expecting the stock to move up 5% or so in the first 30 to 40 days, roughly. Okay. And the problem with a REIT, as you mentioned, Milan, or another position that pays a high dividend, maybe something like SDIV, for example, the ETF that pays a high dividend, you might not see as much growth as you're expecting to make this profitable. The dividend will help, but again, the dividend is going to be priced into the cost of the put. So if I opened a one-year-out trade on a stock that paid a 12% dividend, the at-the-money put would carry a risk the at the money put 360 days out would carry a risk of probably 12.8% because the dividend is priced into the cost of insurance. So without the actual movement of the underlying, even if you held it for 360 days, you shouldn't expect much profit. The profit you get will be on the movement of the stock. And that's where you could probably supply some income methods, but with a REIT or something that pays that high of a dividend, there's not going to be any call premium or, or really a lot of premium you're going to be able to generate. It's going to be based on the movement of the underlying the profit because, as you mentioned, most of those don't show a lot of movement. So the dividend will probably be equal to the risk in that situation. The risk will be a little bit higher than the dividend, still expecting to see some growth on the position. That's what you'll typically see in those scenarios. Okay. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at 6.04 p.m. Eastern time. And that was in relation to, I'm sorry, uh, IT input from my, sorry, just jotting something down here. All right. So I just want to remind everyone, of course, as always, um, 
there we go, that um, today's material, of course, are my thoughts on your questions designed for educational purposes, increasing investing performance and options knowledge. I'm not saying to go out right now and do a position on Shrex. Uh, I'm not saying that um, you should consider a stock repair on any position you have that's underwater. And I'm not saying we should go in and buy TEAM Altesian as a bull call debit spread or anything along those lines. If I was to open TEAM in the next few days, it would be as a radioactive married put, probably with the 145 strike would be my guess in November, where the risk is only around 6% instead of the 8.1 we saw. But any stocks or options discussed today should not be taken as direct trading suggestions. Options do involve risk, even with the married put positions, but it's very small, unlike other strategies. They may not be suitable for all investors. In addition to going to radioactivetrading.com, for those of you who have not gotten the sketch yet, the free white paper, you like the tools today? Hey, you want to take a look at the stock repair tool for some of those stocks you have that are down. Or if you have a stock that's up, you want to use an insurance tool, go to powerop.com, put in your first name and email address, and you'll get full access to power options for 14 days uh, on the real-time service, I believe. Um, but you'll have full access to all those tools to test it out as well. And after that, no credit card is required, but after that, if you decide to subscribe, the subscriptions start at $45 per month. And of course, we do offer uh, historical data, back testing tools, and a real-time service as well. I pointed you to the webinars page a few times, powerup.com slash webinars.asp for that video on managing um, your broken stock position, as well as managing your spread positions, the five or six ways to manage debit spread. You can also check out the blog at any time, blog.powerop.com, or on YouTube. Uh, we're under Power Options. You can see some of our videos there anytime as well. Well, if you think of any questions later on this weekend, remember you can email me at any time to support at powerop.com. Or if you have questions about the blueprint or the radioactive trading techniques, you can reach us at support at radioactivetrading.com. You can also call me during market hours, 302-992-7971. Of course, anyone who is a trial member or a subscriber, remember, you can schedule one of those free coaching sessions at any time. Essentially, a 30 to 45-minute conversation with myself or Ernie will walk you through the tools on the site and answer any questions that you have. Thank you for your excellent questions, ladies and gentlemen. I will try to get this webinar up for you sometime this weekend, the recording, and I'll let you know where you can locate it. I hope everyone has a fantastic weekend, and we'll see you soon. Take care.